Hi. In this lecture, we're going to talk about what I'll call the prehistory of comics. Now, McLeod goes into this in some detail in his first chapter of Understanding Comics, but we're going to dive a little bit deeper. Also, I'm not 100% sure I agree with him. If you remember the earlier lecture on what comics are, some of the forms that he calls comics, I'm not quite so sure I'd go with him and call them comics. But I think they really are important in building to the form that we understand today as comics. So these are the sorts of things that I'm going to talk about today. The kinds of art forms that build up to comics. We start at the very beginning, about 30,000 years ago, in Chauvet, France. One of the reasons I like to start here is that humans have been picking up rocks and charred sticks and trying to make marks for a very, very long time. And one of the things that's interesting to me is that as long as humans have been doing that, they've been trying to figure out how to show movement, the passage of time in space. Before we had film, if you wanted to show movement and the passage of time, you had to figure out some way to do it on a still surface. Well, they had figured out a pretty sophisticated way in these old caves. Now imagine, if you will, you're sitting in a cave in a firelight. The light's going to be flickering. It's going to show some parts more clearly than others, and that's going to make these kinds of moments really interesting to look at. Many art historians look at these lions and don't see somebody trying to draw 14 lions. They see an ancient human trying to draw one lion running multiple times. Especially in some of them that you can see, like on like in the top center, where two heads seem to be connected at the same time. What they think is that what they were trying to show was motion. And they managed to do it. Here's another example from the same cave painting of horses. It would be 25,000 years before the ancient Egyptians tried their hands at using sequential visual art to tell a story and show time passing. Now, as McLeod reminds us, I'm not talking about hieroglyphs here. Hieroglyphs are written language. They're not pictures. They look pictorial, but they're meant to represent words and sounds. So they're not really pictures. They're the ancient Egyptian equivalent of ABC. The same is true of kanji, or Chinese characters. As McLeod tells us, in ancient Egypt, the pre-comics art was tomb paintings. And the most famous of these tomb paintings was menas. I've got a couple different images for you here. A lot of these are recreations because you can't really go into the tomb. What we have is an image that spans across the wall and shows the passage of a whole day. We have movement, we have space, we have different characters. The story of the day kind of tracks like a snake as you move up and down the wall. And as you move across the other four walls, you get different aspects of the day, including, say, this day, which is Mena over the fields. There are other images of Mena and his family hunting, um, and other sports and courtly life. Later in Rome, similar things would be done, but this time in sculpture. For example, Trajan's Column was built in 113 AD to celebrate Rome's victory over the Dacians. As you can see, as you can see from some of the images, there used to be stairs, but they've removed them from people touching the frieze over time and damaging it. If you would start at the bottom and follow it all the way up the top, slowly but surely, you would follow the story of the Roman battle and ultimate victory over the Dacians. Meanwhile, in the Far East, particularly in China, Hand scroll paintings become popular around 600 AD in the Tang Dynasty, and this form spreads around Eastern Asia. It finds its kind of apotheosis in Japan around 1000 AD in a particular form of hand scroll painting called emakimono. These were painted pictures and text sections that were joined together in a scroll to sort of tell a long, illustrated story. The image here is a rolled up scroll. Here are some images of these scrolls. So this one is actually a ver an early version of a Chinese hand scroll. As you can see, it doesn't really have a lot of text. You can see some ta caption text on the side. At the very top, I have the image of the full scroll unfurled, uh, and, and then a sort of close-up here. 
Uh, and here's a, an even closer up version of some of these images. So you get these sort of image sections with captions describing the image that is being illustrated and vice versa. Now this uh, hand scroll, Admonitions of a Court Instructress, dates from around 400 to 700 AD, but most art historians understand that it's probably a copy of an earlier piece that has since been lost. The Chinese hand scrolls have been around for quite a long time, probably not too far after the Romans were doing their statue columns. Here's an example of the Genji Monogatari Imaki, uh, completed somewhere around 1120 to 1140 AD. What you can see from this image that I'm showing right now is the text section on the right. Here are some close-ups, slightly altered so that the images are clearer of some of the other illustrations in this set of scrolls. Choju Jinbutsugiga was made by a monk named Toba around 1100 to 1200 AD, so around the same time as some of these other monks. It didn't have text, but it starred playful anthropomorphic animals and satirical images of people. Because of its style and its charm, some scholars go as far as to call it the first manga. Back in Europe, medieval artists are creating many interesting examples of sequential art and visual narrative art. Uh, for example, we've mentioned the Bayou Tapestry. McLeod is very interested in this. It's 230 feet long and was completed around 1080 to honor the Battle of Hastings in 1066. As we go across the tapestry, you see different scenes of the battle along with small captions letting us know what's happening in the scene. There are several places online where you can actually download and view the entire length of the Bayou Tapestry in high resolution, and I recommend you do that. Around the same time, illuminated manuscripts are becoming uh, very common. These combined carefully hand-scripted texts with beautiful illustrations. Sometimes the calligraphy is so impressive that the line between words and art become quite blurry. And this is another thing that comics really tends to play with. Because it's a form in which there is always words and images present, it makes us think about what the purpose and power of words are and what the purpose and power of images are. Here are some examples. This Lindisfarne Gospel from 700 AD is famous. These beautiful images at the top are actually the first two letters of the text. The Harding Bible by St. Stephen Harding is a really interesting case, because not only is it a sort of classic illuminated manuscript that has illustrations along with the text, but in many of the spots it actually sort of forms paneled images to illustrate sections of the text. It looks a lot like a sort of comic book we would understand today. Take, for example, this scene from the Battle of David and Goliath. In fact, they use a technique that Jack Kirby would perfect many years later, in which Goliath is so impressively large, he cannot be contained by the panels of the image and breaks out of them. As we move into the Renaissance, artists begin to be concerned with many other kinds of issues, including composition and realism, lighting, but several artists experiment with what's called continuous narrative, or composite images. And similar to cave paintings, these show many scenes with the same characters in one panel or space. So take, for example, this excerpt from Duccio's The Healing of the Man Born Blind in 1308 or 1311. In that first part of the image, Jesus touches the man born blind's eyes, and in the second, we see that it's the same man who had been born blind, but he has turned and is now healed. Uh, likewise, this image called the Tribute Money by Masakio, done in between 1425 and 1428. Uh, this tells a parable in which uh, Jesus and his disciples coming, are coming into the city and are told that they need to pay tribute. This is happening in the center of the image. Not having any money on them, Jesus tells his disciple Peter that he needs to go to the water and catch a fish. On the left of the image, we see Peter going and catching that fish. Sure enough, in that fish's mouth is a gold coin. Peter then goes, as we see in the right of the image, and pays the tribute so that they may enter the city. All of these take place in the same image, so we get the whole story. We also get multiple aspects. In a modern comic, we would just see these in different panels, but in the Renaissance, they decided to sort of draw them as though they were taking place in this same canvas. Across the ocean, Mesoamerican cultures are also doing their own thing in codices. Like hieroglyphs, their language looks like sequential pictures, but isn't. McLeod talks about this a little bit as well. However, in codices, words and images freely 
commingle. So this is an example from the Madrid or the Truano Codex, which is a Mayan codex from somewhere between 900 and 1450 AD. The pieces with the thick black outlines, those are letters. But the pieces in the middle are images and illustrations. Here we have Codex Selden or the Codex Anute, which again is from somewhere between 900 and 1500 AD. Here you can see the language, Mayan language on the top uh, with the images on the bottom. And here, unlike in the previous slide, you can actually see the images and story bits cut into panels. Unlike maybe some of our future texts, we don't necessarily see word balloons, but we get captions, we get images, and we get panels. Now I mentioned word balloons, and that's actually on purpose, because it turns out the Mesoamerican cultures had a way of showing word balloons. In other moments in the Selden Codex, as you can see in the top, there are emanata coming out of the mouths of some of these characters. So the two characters on the right are being tortured by the characters on the left, and you see these kind of tongue-like protrusions coming out of their mouths. And at the very end of those are these little oblong discs that are red and white. We know from other aspects of this text that there's bloody daggers, and so many scholars think that what this is showing is that these men are sort of shouting bloody daggers, or they're shouting epithets, insults, at the men who are attacking them. Now on the bottom left, which is really interesting because we're able to date it a little bit older, from 650 BCE, uh, this is an Olmec seal. Now on the right of the image, we get some shapes that are a little bit hard to make out. That's the name of a ruler. His name was Three Ajaw. On the left, we see a bird. And that bird has two lines coming from his mouth that are speaking the name of Three Ajaw. So this is really interesting because it's very clearly this bird speaking that language. Likewise, in this image from Teotihuacan, we have a man from whose open mouth is emanating this kind of beautiful stream. Scholars aren't sure if this is sacred speech that is not meant to be understood or some sort of sign of holy breath. But there's an understanding that these characters are speaking and they want to show that there is some sort of noise and movement coming out of their mouths. Now this one I really like. I wasn't looking for it, but I was at an art museum in Denver and ran across this guy. Again, we see the Mayan language in the thick black outlines. Uh, this is a vase with a palace scene from either Mexico or Guatemala. And they know for a fact that it's pre-Columbian. You know, Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492. And this one is dated somewhere between 600 and 800 AD. So as we'll see later, Europeans do a sort of speech goal thing. Uh, but this is happening well before that. So we see this wonderfully grumpy looking man on the bottom of this vase. In the center of this image, we see the kind of language coming from his mouth in a right angle, and the very clear line drawn from his mouth to that language. This is, it seems to me without a doubt, kind of speech balloon happening literally a thousand years before it happens in newspapers. So we jump back across the sea to Europe, where in 1440, Johannes Gutenberg invents the printing press, and with it, modern movable type printing. And this is a very big deal. It really can't be understated how much of a big deal the invention of printing press and movable type is. Why? Well, because many of the books and images that I've shown before, these are one-of-a-kind works of art. One person has to sit and copy the whole Bible every time you want a Bible. With the printing press, Sure, it might take a long time to set up each letter of the press, but once you have those set up, you can make as many prints of the Bible as you want. Because of this, the printing press and movable type printing lead to a massive cultural shift across Europe. One of the main things, of course, as you might expect, is a massive rise in literacy. Books are no longer just a thing that the very rich and the very trained have access to. A lot of people can get access to books, and therefore it matters more that they can read. Print productions are now available to a growing middle class. This is true of books, but also eventually of images. Now this era in time, because of many of the philosophers and massive jumps in technology and scientific understanding is often called the Enlightenment. And in the Enlightenment, newspapers become a huge deal. They begin to be printed in earnest in the early 17th century or the 1600s. And alongside newspapers, another format is very popular. It's called the broadsheet or the broadside. We would sort of understand it as a tabloid. 
So a broadsheet or a broadside is a large format newspaper or poster. It would be very large, and it would be printed on two sides. Uh, and usually one side, at least one side, would be heavily illustrated. On the right is an example of a broadside, and I'll get you another example in a moment. Um, and in broadsides and newspapers, we get the birth of political cartooning. These really begin to take off in the mid-18th century, securing their popularity around the French Revolution in the 1780s. Now here's another example of a broadside. One of the things you might notice is what looks like word balloons coming out of people's mouths. These were common in medieval manuscripts and in broadsheets and would disappear by the 17th and 18th centuries, only to come back into popularity in the end of the 19th century. Here are some examples of some 19th century political cartoons, mostly from newspapers, although some of them as well from magazines and journals. These ones are English in particular, although the French also had quite a tradition. Here are some examples of newspaper... Here are some examples of political cartooning from the newspapers in the 18th and 19th centuries. These ones are English, Thomas Rowlandson, George Cruikshank, and James Gilray. Although the French also had a vigorous tradition of their own. We'll end today with Rudolf Topfer. Rudolf Topfer was a Swiss artist whose day job was as a teacher and educator. He was born in 1799 and lived until 1846. He's often called the grandfather of comics, and you'll see why here in a moment. One of the things he did uh, for his students was that they weren't as interested in a lot of the material he was trying to teach them as he would like. So he published these funny stories with funny illustrations that taught moral lessons. He illustrated himself so that his boys would have entertaining things to read that would still teach them good lessons. These stories would be deeply influential on the next generation of newspaper cartoonists, particularly in Europe, but also throughout the United States. Several of his books would be translated from, from the French Swiss into English and make it over to the United States. Here are some examples of some of Topfer's work. Uh, you've seen it before when we talked about definitions of comics, but as you can see, he splits each of his pages into several panels uh, with these sort of cartoony, caricatured images, and each panel has a caption to go alongside of it to explain what's happening, and to tell the story further. There aren't any word balloons, there aren't really any dialogue boxes, but we are very close to what we might consider a comics form of storytelling. Uh, here's another example, um, slightly clearer and larger resolution of a page from a Topfer storyline. Well, stopping at Topfer because this is kind of the point where Everybody agrees comics is born. We get into the newspapers, we get into this really obvious sort of sequential art that looks like the comics that we know and understand. This is the end of the origin story. The superhero is about to be born. See you next time when we'll talk about the newspapers.